How long has she been out there? Um, February 28th um, of this year, she left from the pavilion at Lewis Gale Hospital and flew to the addiction center in Las Vegas for treatment. And we were so, so hopeful. And that treatment um, did not work, the treatment center with her. She did spend a month at uh, a place called We Care House, which was a smaller facility. It was all women, all women, run by women recovering from addiction. And she did very well there. They spoke very highly of her. She thrived. And then we transitioned her back to the addiction center so that she would get like the um, assistance with the halfway housing and still continue with rehab and that type of thing. And our hope was that she would be there for maybe another three or six months before transitioning back here. You know, because they, they always say keep them out of their, their playground, keep them out of their sandbox and, and get them strong. How long has she uh, been struggling with addiction? Um, really bad for about three years, but started um, probably five years ago. And um, she, like so many, um, started with prescription medication and um, found out, you know, you find out what that does to you and it takes all your fears away and, and, and life is good and, and she, like so many, if you read their stories, are very sensitive, very, very intelligent, very gifted, um, and again, very sensitive. But, you know, her, like so many in her generation, who would dabble in, she had prescription cough medication with codeine in it, and then so many of her friends would have you know, pills when you go into your, your parents' uh, medicine cabinets and you go out and you dabble with some pills and, and some alcohol. And the nature of the disease of addiction is, is that if you have that uh, addiction, addictive tendency in you, then you are, you are quick to become addicted. You know, it's like an, an alcoholism is the same way. Um, for you and I, we can go sit down to lunch and we can have a glass of wine and we can get up and walk away. If you're an alcoholic, you can't have that first glass of wine. You cannot walk away. If you're an addict, opiates are the same way in your body. You can, you, you know, and the stronger the medication you're on, you know, and you go from the opiates that then became more controlled, they weren't able to obtain them easily on the street. Heroin became extremely easy to get. Heroin, it's much easier to get heroin and it's much cheaper to get heroin than it is to get prescription opiates. Well, what do you hope, um, I guess, you know, she went through several treatments. Um, how can they make these treatment facilities stricter and more efficient for patients like Tess who just want to get help and get better? Yeah, that's a good question, and I think there's a lot of good minds that are diligently working on that right now. I don't think there's any perfect answer, um, you know, and there is also that, that true being of the person has to be at a place where they want that. But I know so many times, you know, it, a person can in themselves, you know, be at that place but then it's so hard to get. You can get into a short-term treatment program fairly quickly. You know, Carillion offers um, three and four day detox treatment programs. Lewis Gale offers the same through the pavilion. But there again, it, 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 it's long-term treatment and it's long-term follow-up. And I know one of the things that I've been an advocate in fighting for is that particularly now when you meet with local representatives such as I have, and you talk to them about funding for treatment, they are so quick to say that there, is, that there is just no funding and it's so expensive. And my argument then lies in that, but I, I have a daughter who was in and out of four-day treatment programs probably six times the last year that she was here in Roanoke. Um, every time she, she went to the short-term treatment program, 
She was sent out on eight new prescription medications. Um, they offer, you know, some outpatient follow-up, and, and but there's a lot of loopholes where, you know, when, when you capture the person in when they want help, you know, they really, really need to be captured. I know Tess loved, well, one of the programs that she really loved the most was the um, program at the Pavilion at Lewis Gale. She would have stayed there for years, I think. She just thought so highly of the people there. But that's not the protocol, they can't stay. But then you take the monies that are spent on these three and four day programs when we're taking people in and then they're going back out on the street, combined with the emergency room, uh, frequency of emergency room visits for an addict for either abscesses or infections or any other complication from their disease, the money somewhere is having to be spent. I mean, this is a disease, and it is a long-term, and it is a chronic disease. And one of the biggest problems, I think, is that it has been always viewed as something that we can treat short-term, and we can't. We have to look at, and it's, it's very difficult. I don't think there's any magic solution yet that I know of, but it's very lengthy. Well, how do you want to remember your daughter? You have a lot of pictures of her at uh, different points in her life, but how do you want to remember her and other people to remember her? I think, um, I mean, I know I want to remember her for all the happy times that we had, for the beautiful young woman that she was. Um, and I, I know that everyone now, anyone who, who is thinking about Tess is going to be thinking the same thing. Um, because she was just one of those beautiful people. Not only was she just so magnificently beautiful in her face and her smile, but she just had a way that she made everybody around her feel so blessed and so happy. And again, she had such a, a, a rich gift of sharing language and um, but that's how I'll remember Tess. I remember so many fond evenings just sitting here at home with her, out on the deck and, and, and reading a book and chatting about the books. And we love to share books. Um, you know, we would often sit down by the wood stove in the winter, and Tess with her dog, and each one of us with a book and just reading and reading. And um, also one of my favorite stories about Tess is when the children were, were uh, little, and we would go to the beach in the summers, and we used to have a, a house down at Bald Head Island, and of uh, all my four children, Tess was the one who loved to walk with me the most down the beach. And we loved, you see around in my house, and you'll see sand dollars and so many different places. And Tess was my little walker, and we would get up early when the tide was out, and we'd go for long, long walks. I mean, we'd be an hour or two walking down the beach, and. Everybody said, how did you find so many sand dollars? Well, she was the one that always went on those long walks. And we became very, very close during those summers when we would go on those long, long walks together. And that's what I'll always remember of my Tess. We had some very special times together. Has, um, has police in Las Vegas, have you talked to them? Have they yes. said what happened? Well, I mean, I know what happened. I know enough of the details that I want to know um, as far as how she was found, um, the condition that she was found in. Um, I've shared with them any information that I have that may be of assistance to them, and I will share more information uh, as I know it. But they have been very sensitive, um, and they, I think, are genuinely very concerned about um, finding out why someone would do this.